the discomfort might have something to teach us. If we fix the discomfort quickly, we might not realize what's driving the discomfort, what the values, the beliefs, the emotions, the feelings that are underneath the surface of it. And if we're always escaping discomfort by making ourselves comfortable, we're we're actually going to end up living a truncated life. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you would like to support this podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. So then today, we come to the fifth hindrance and also the fifth assist support. And the word can be the same for both. Doubt. There is wise doubt and there's unwise doubt. There's doubt that hinders and there's doubt that opens us up. And to be able to tell the difference is very useful. The word that's translated as doubt can also mean indecisiveness, to be indecisive, to hesitate, and to be perplexed. So it's a little bit bigger in meaning than just the word doubt. And I think this is a part of being indecisive and hesitant is very important for practitioners. <clears throat> because for someone who wants to do this practice, it works best if you do it wholeheartedly, if you really give yourself to it. But if you have doubts about the practice, doubts about yourself, doubts about the teachings, if you have, uh, you're indecisive of whether it's better to meditate or go, my, or, or to go mountain biking, you know, you know, you're, you're struggling and being in, trying to decide what to do. And it's just, you know, you can't really give yourself over to it. When doubt becomes extreme, sometimes people leave the practice entirely. And uh, they, there's some, some idea <clears throat> that uh, of the five hindrances, doubt is the most dangerous for a practitioner because a practitioner might leave the practice behind because they have so much indecisiveness or so much doubt about it or something. And doubt can take many forms. Uh, it can just be doubt about knowing what to do. What practice am I supposed to do? And, or how does a mindfulness apply to impatience? And I don't know what to do. And Do I feel my body? Do I note it? And do I go back to my breathing? What am I supposed to do here? <clears throat> so kind of swimming in doubt and confusion and Maybe too many choices if you've learned too many techniques. It could be that the doubt is about your ability to do it. Oh, the practice is phenomenal. It's like one of the best things going. I can't believe that I encountered in my lifetime. It's I'm so happy, but I can't do it. I don't have the ability. It's for the great yogis in the Himalaya mountains. Those are the people that can do it. But, you know, I'm just bumbling through my life and, you know, who am I? I'm uh, I don't count for much and I can't really do this great thing. And so this self-doubt that that could be quite strong. So um, I believe that in some of these forests in New Zealand, you have these wooden walkways that take you through them. Is that right? <clears throat> And maybe some places you do that because to the side of the wood walkway, maybe it's swampy or it's wet or it's really lots of vines and tangled underbrush that can be hard to walk in. But if you stay on the, on the track, you can go far into the forest and around and see all kinds of things. But then if you're not paying attention, say your mind wanders off and you end up stepping off the wood track onto the whatever is there next to it. 
and you started rooting that it's really hard to walk here. I mean, this is hard, it's difficult, and and you know, like, oh well, I guess I have to try harder. Or maybe I have the wrong shoes. I should have had better shoes, or maybe I'm not the right person to walk here. And you keep trying and trying, you know, and like and then it dawns on you right next to you, like one foot away, is this walkway. <laughs> And and all that kind of thinking and wondering and what should I do and how should I do it, how should I get out of here? The answer was right there next to you all the time. Just take that step <laughs> up onto the walkway and then you're back on solid support. And then you step off again and this time you're really angry, full of ill will. How could they make a park with, with the trail is so overgrown and so swampy and... You know, those people who make parks, they didn't plan it well and didn't put the trails in the right place. And I'm going to write a letter and you're just go, going along angry. And, you know, <clears throat> and then after a while you say, well, it's really my fault. How could I have chosen this particular park? I'm a terrible park chooser. <laughs> and then after, you know, going through a storm like that, they kind of like pause for a moment and take a deep breath and you look, oh, there's a walkway right there. And you step up. Oh, this is easy. So it turns out there's always a walkway right next to you. Whatever the hindrance is, there's always a walkway, just a, just a breath away, half a breath away. Believe it or not, it's to know that you're in the grip of a hindrance. To clearly see, oh, this is doubt then you're back up on the walkway. You might not stay there, <laughs> but that moment you've stepped away. It's that significant mindfulness to have a clear moment of mindfulness, clear moment of seeing, oh, this is what's going on. What happens to many people is they don't see the significance of that moment of mindfulness. And they find themselves right back off the walkway, back through the swamps. You, you know, you're like, oh, I have to figure out what to do now that I see that I have doubt and I don't know what to do. And, you know, it's doubt is so hard. And, oh, that's doubt. Again, I'll get back up on the walkway, walking along. Well, I'm the wrong one to do it. This is the wrong day. And back up. But we keep slipping off, slipping off, slipping off. But to stay on the walkway is what mindfulness practice is about. Stay clearly seeing, clearly seeing. And what you can clearly see is that your seeing is muddled. <laughs> oh, I'm confused. I'm perplexed. I don't know what to do. That's a completely valid moment of mindfulness. You're seeing the truth. I'm confused. At that moment, you're back up on the walkway. So it's, this is true to all the hindrances. It's powerful just to really learn to recognize them and name them and see them. This is what it is. But doubt can be quite difficult because, you know, it's uh, sometimes questioning the practice itself or questioning ourselves as practice or this being perplexed what we should do. And a little bit it's the danger of the kind of Buddhism we teach, the Vipassana practice. There is so much instruction. I mean, we're like, we're, you know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> The Zen people look at this and like, like they shake their head, you know, like, you know, like, wow. <laughs> and, um, the, um, and I was very lucky in my early years of practice that I did do Zen and I had so little instruction. I wasn't told what to do. And that was great because I didn't know I was supposed to do it. <laughs> and so I just kept showing up, showing up trying to be present for each experience I had every moment, trying to be there for it, uh, a kind of uh, uncompromising acceptance of the moment. 
and I didn't, I had no idea I was supposed to be thinking. I had no idea it was supposed to be any different than what it was. I just had to show up, show up. And so I was saved a lot of the challenge of having too many instructions, too much to do. I'm now teaching this practice with all the instructions that come along with it. And I'm very happy with it. I think it's brilliant and wonderful and valuable to learn. But I make this point here today so that you don't, you, you, that you don't forget that in the essence, this mindfulness practice is very simple. Be very careful that you don't slip away from the simplicity. And all the different instructions are there to help you stay simple, not to kind of be complicated and figure everything out in a difficult way. It might take a while to learn that simplicity through it all, but that's, a, I think, a wonderful guide for it all. So doubt can also be useful. There's a lot of things that our society teaches us that is well worth doubting. And society can provide, and families and everything can, provo- can provide ideas that how we're supposed to live that are, has a lot of authority behind it, a lot of insistence, this is the right way. And to start doubting. And it's not uncommon for people to, as they grow up, some people doubt the religion they grew up with. Some people doubt their... The, the educational path they're on, that they were maybe put put on by, who knows what, by their family. Some people doubt that their idea of uh, success is money or the idea of success is status or the idea of success is having a lot of Instagram followers. There's all these things that people really now are really wedded to that it's actually healthy to start doubting it. Doubt can feel uncomfortable, the uncertainty of it, the unknown of this, of it all. And, um, and so how do we find our way with healthy doubt that are questioning things that should be questioned? How do we know the difference between a healthy doubt and one that's hindering us and keeping us tied up? So I'll leave that question hanging for now. The, um, one of the features of kind of English speaking Dharma that is absent, I think, in much of certainly in the insight movement in Thailand and Burma and places like that, teachers there is putting a tremendous value on not knowing putting a lot of value on being comfortable with uncertainty, being comfortable with not knowing, and maybe even doubting the value of understanding everything and needing to understand. And I think it's really a wonderful gift this practice can give us as we start learning to have a comfort, a comfort level with being uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable, we can do many different ways. And for the topic of today, (laughs) we can be uncomfortable with not knowing. We can be comfortable being uncertain what to do and what's supposed to happen. We can be uncomfortable with not understanding ourselves. Discomfort is an important teacher. Because one of the things we want to learn to do in this practice is, on one hand, learn to be comfortable with discomfort or be okay with discomfort, not to add, make it more complicated than it needs to be. To step up on the wooden walkway and say, I'm uncomfortable and that's okay. As opposed to, I'm uncomfortable and desperately have to get This means I have to do something. I have to fix something. So this um, comfort with not knowing. uh, And there's a number of advantages with that. The the advantage with being comfortable with discomfort is that the discomfort 
might have something to teach us. If we fix the discomfort quickly, we might not realize what's driving the discomfort, what the values, the beliefs, the emotions, the feelings that are underneath the surface of it. And if we're always escaping discomfort by making ourselves comfortable, we're we're actually going to end up living a truncated life. And so having some modicum of comfort with discomfort, willingness to be uncomfortable when we do this practice is really important. As I like to say, if you're free only when you're comfortable, you're not really free. So if, um, you know, to work with discomfort, but don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Just step up on the walkway. Wow, today I'm uncomfortable. That's all it is. It's just discomfort. And I don't like it. And then you're up on the walkway saying, well, this is what not liking is like. As opposed to thinking that you're an embarrassment to Buddhism because you have a desire or have a preference. Just, oh, back on the walkway. Oh, not liking, not liking. To be comfortable with not knowing also is it is like opening a door to see in a new way. We often come along with so much preconceived ideas about others, about ourselves, about the world, what's supposed to happen. And these preconceived ideas that we carry along can be severe limitation. They keep us from kind of new vistas, deeper understandings, fuller understandings. Or, or maybe more important, they keep us from letting go more fully, relaxing, because some of these ideas and preconceived ideas come with attachment, with clinging, with reactivity, with pressure. So to be comfortable with not knowing is like having the curtains in, in front of your windows always pulled closed, and you finally open the curtains and you can look out and see what's there. I think I'm saying that because I'm looking out the windows here and I don't really get that kind of view out my windows. This is nice. This is different for me. So if you can come back on the walkway in the simple act of knowing of mindfulness, then you might also consider practicing feeling and relaxing. Once you're on the walkway, those are really great next steps. It kind of maybe grounds you back on the walkway, settles you here. Oh, yes. Because one act of one moment of mindfulness might not be enough from preventing you from stepping off the walkway. But if you follow the mindfulness with, let's just really register this experience. Let's sense and feel. Let's, let's open the whole body to really sense and experience, what is this? And if there's any tension, relax. And then the instructions are, do it over. Do it again. Start at the top. Know, feel, and relax. And if you get bored with that, switch the orders around. It's not like a magic thing that always has to be this way. Sometimes I do um, relax, feel, and then know. And that's kind of fun. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, So don't be afraid of doubt. So in the question of how do you know the difference between doubt which is useful and doubt which is not? The first thing to say about that, <clears throat> maybe you don't need to know if you're on the walkway. Trust the walkway. Trust the mindfulness. It's mind, With mindfulness, things work themselves out. The, the amazing thing about this path of mindfulness 
is that it kind of makes room for things to find their way, work themselves out, that you could never figure out yourself. Uh, it's one of the great gifts this practice has given me from kind of a life lesson is this profound trust in being mindful. Especially when I don't, don't know what to do. To keep showing up. And sometimes in interpersonal situations where there's conversations that are difficult and I don't, don't know what to do, I've learned, okay, just stay present. Recognize what's happening. Maybe practice mindfulness out loud, explaining this is what's happening now for me. This is what's happening now. What's happening for you? And just kind of slowly think something shifts and changes and opens and reveals itself. And then things begin to change on their own or become clear on their own. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to figure it out. So maybe you don't always have to know if your doubt is the good kind or the bad kind, healthy or not healthy. All you need to do is make sure you stay on the walkway and just keep knowing, feelings, exploring, getting to know what's happening, being present, relaxing. And then over time, everything gets revealed. Over time, it becomes clear, oh, now I see. This wasn't so useful, this doubt. That's just doubt. I was hindered by the doubt. But you don't have to rush quickly to understand all this stuff. Not knowing, not understanding is a really useful skill if you want to just learn to stay on the walkway. But one of the doubts that people can have is about Buddhism itself. Some people <coughs> orient, some people don't care about Buddhism and tune out the teachers when they use the B word. <laughs> and that that's fine. But um the um some people the way they're oriented, maybe because the religion they grew up with, is somehow this idea that you have to kind of, if you're going to be involved with Buddhism, you have to kind of believe it all. It's like a take it all or not kind of scenario. And then they hear some of the teachings, and I have serious doubt about that. I'm not sure about that. And then there's a lot of doubt. Well, what should I believe it? But I should, I'm supposed to believe it. But I, you know, but I don't believe it. Should I believe it? But I'm supposed to. Ain't I supposed to? The teacher, the teacher is teaching it. So shouldn't I have to believe it? So I think doubting Buddhism is probably always a good idea. As long as it doesn't keep you from practicing. And the reason I say that is because the Buddhism that you're really supposed to learn, the Buddhism that's supposed to guide you, is the, is the Buddhism that's inside of you. The book that you're supposed to read is not the written book, but the book in your heart. Everything you need to know about Buddhism, you can find through your own sensitivity. And uh, when the Buddha talks about what not to have doubt about, what to be have certainty about, one of the things he talked about is is having no doubt, someone who matures in this practice has no doubt about what is wholesome and what is not wholesome, what is skillful, what is not skillful, what is healthy, what is not healthy. We learn to recognize for ourselves what is beneficial for us to do and what is not. That doesn't require a lot of belief, complicated metaphysical, cosmological beliefs that Buddhism might offer. It requires a sensitivity that you could do this by yourself. And it's a sensitivity, it's an activity that you're all doing already. You go through the day all the time 
making little choices about what's beneficial and what's not beneficial. If it's raining, is it beneficial to put on a rain jacket or is it not? If you go to buy shoes, is the shoe one size smaller than what you need, beneficial or not? Two sizes bigger, is it beneficial or not? You go and you're finding your way. You're, and mostly people put on shoes and try them out. And that the very thing that Buddhism wants you to do, you're doing when you try out a pair of shoes. You're being a good Buddhist. <laughs> Unless vanity takes over. <laughs> <laughs> so this phenomenally important activity where we find the Dharma is something you're doing already, but Buddhism is validating it or bringing it out for its greater value provided you have a greater sensitivity to sense and feel and understand what is wholesome and not wholesome. And it's not wholesome and not wholesome It isn't because of the consequences of the action so much that that's part of the equation. But the the, the essence of this wholesome and unwholesome is you can feel in what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're doing, what motivates you. If you're very sensitive, very attentive and present for it, you can feel there's an ouch in it or there's an ah in it. And I choose this kind of, is this expression, ouch and ah, to try to make it as simple as possible, as obvious as possible. Because if you add words to that, like if I say it's beneficial or harmful, then we've kind of left the experiential world, maybe, and like, well, I have to figure out whether it's beneficial. But the ouch is right here. It's in the experience. Now, you have a thorn in your foot as you walk. The ouch is right there. You get the message. Take the thorn out. If you're walking on hot sand and it's burning your feet and you put on your shoes, you get immediately, it feels, ah, that's good. So even the movements of the mind, if the mind starts clinging, if the mind starts having hostility, if it has greed, if you're sensitive enough, you can feel the stress and the strain, the ouch of those movements. I've known people who didn't give up something they were really angry with, resentful about, until they turn their attention around 180 degrees from the object of their anger to feel what it was, what it's like to be angry. And they said, wow, I'm harming myself more than the person I'm angry with. The person I'm angry with doesn't even know I'm still angry. What good does it do that person to be angry at him? But boy, am I harming myself. And so the sense of t- and that can be done in a very refined, subtle way. Feel a little, the irritation comes up. It can be the most natural thing in the world <clears throat> to be irritated. You're not a bad person for being irritated, for being angry. But you can f- step back on the walkway. I'm angry. I'm irritated. Now let's feel it. Remember how important that is? Let's feel the irritation. Oh, lo and behold, when I feel it, 
rather than stay thinking about what I'm irritated about, when I feel what it's like to be irritated, lo and behold, there's an ouch. Well, it's right for me to be irritated. I've been, I did, you know, it's, I'm allowed to be irritated. I'm supposed to be irritated because it's unjust that they charge me too much at the store or something. Some people are really quick to defend their fe- feeling ouch. Why is that? I'm, sp- I'm allowed to, I'm supposed to, I'm allowed to, I should, I have to. Buddhism challenges that idea. That there is no justification that says that you're required to find your way through life by doing movements in your mind that harm you, that have put stress, strain, or ouches on you. And in Buddhism says, you're allowed to prioritize the ah. You're allowed to get a sense of where healthy kind of mental and spiritual health exists. You're allowed to feel what it's like to have a sense of thriving, a sense of spiritual abundance, to have joy, to have a sense of well-being. You're allowed to kind of tune into that and allow that to come. Part of this value of the feeling, no feel and relax, the feeling part is that we also get heightened sensitivity, familiarity with how it, what it feels like to feel good. And I have a radical idea for all of you. And that is, you probably feel some some well-being, some joy, some delight in your life more often than you realize. Or more often, there's more often opportunities for delight and joy and than you avail yourself of. Because you have important things to be angry about. You have important things to be doubting. You have important things to be upset about. You have important things to be wanting. You have important things to be, you know, like, you know, going through all the, go, it's very important to go through the litany of all the things that's wrong with you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so important to be in fantasy and planning ahead and doing all this other stuff rather than noticing the sky is blue rather than noticing those little fish in the pond, rather than noticing how these tree ferns uncurl. I guess you guys are all used to it. (laughs) (laughs) My wife and I are like, wow. (laughs) We want to take pictures, but they're up there so high. How do you get? But then we read today, we said, let's not go to that park. We were saying, where, where do we go in here? <laughs> in New Zealand. Turns out there's a park that has majestic, beautiful, wonderful trees to be seen. California redwoods. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I would have enjoyed it if I was there, but... But the idea that there's actually more to enjoy, but we're usually too distracted to enjoy it. And the many ways which we're distracted is the ouch, doing ouch things. So one of the things that Buddha says is someone who matures in this practice has tremendous confidence in knowing the distinction between what's wholesome and unwholesome. And that's where you find your path. That's where the Dharma lives. That's the book to read. And it might not be automatic and quick, 
But over time, as you do this mindfulness practice of knowing and seeing and relaxing, feeling and relaxing, you develop a skill, a capacity to recognize and feel. It's both a capacity to feel, but also a capacity to hold it, to be with it. So that you're increasing your capacity to be with discomfort, increasing your capacity to be with some of the really difficult things that go on in life, grief, fear, and your capacity to hold it rather than be pushed around by it or caught by it or under the burden of it. Oh, stand on the walkway. Wow. There's a lot of grief. This is grief and I'll hold it. I'll feel it. But the very ability to be open and available, this capacity to feel it all, that's, that's difficult, is also a capacity to feel what's good, what's beneficial and what's beautiful and joy. That capacity to be open means you're going to be open to both. It's not going to be one way or the other. But the capacity to be open is wholesome, is health, healthy. And then you feel. And then you study and see what's going on. So when you have doubt and you develop your capacity to be sensitive to the ouches and the ahs, you can feel and sense how some doubts are closing you down, are tightening you up, or are weighing you down. And some doubts you say, well, this has a possibility of opening. This is doubting how I was closed. This is doubting some of the difficult beliefs that I was living under. And I can see how difficult and painful those beliefs are, how limiting they are. And now that I'm doubting it, the doubting seems like maybe this is like knocking on the door to see if the door will open. What else is here? So in this way, we become more and more our own teacher. We find our own way through all this. And I'm still uh, inspired by sitting with you last night, the last sitting, coming in here and being here. I don't know how, I mean, there's so much variation to what happens when people close their eyes. But um, I was so confident in all of you. I felt this sweetness, this quiet, this stillness that was here. This is the kind of stillness and sensitivity that brings out the best in people. Because in this kind of stillness and quiet, it just feels like violence against oneself. To get up in the middle of the sitting and start swearing in this room. (laughs) I mean, who would want to do that when it's so sweet and good and tender and present? In that kind of, in in the depth of a retreat, the quietest, calmest, more sensitive you become, it can feel so wrong to lie, even a minor lie. One of the things that inspires me as a teacher, is we'll do these you know, meetings, talk about people's people, talk about their practice. And sometimes afterwards, people come back and say, you know, I want to correct what I said. It wasn't, I lied to you, or I said what wasn't true. I said, really? And so they tell me, and I still can't believe they're telling me this because it, it's so inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm so inspired that there's something about the sensitivity of being in this kind of practice that even the littlest kind of falsehood, exaggeration, feels like it feels off. It feels like something is wrong. I'm inspired by that capacity we have for that. That's such an amazing thing that we want to, that this inner sensitivity to honesty and being truthful and that it, it's 
operates so strongly in us. So that kind of sensitivity, deep sensitivity to another way of living, one that has integrity and honesty, one that is not interested in all the ouches, not interested in harm, harming oneself, harming someone else, is reorienting the life to have a different reference point for what animates our life, the source from which we understand our life. And this is what I talked about earlier in the retreat. For many people, the source that animates their life that is their reactivity. And unfortunately, many people are simply living, reacting to their reactivity, which is cause for reacting again. And it just kind of like endless spirals, endless kind of, kind of unfolding of reactivity to one thing after another, to one thing after the other. And reactivity is this habitual, instinctual way of responding with greed, with hatred, with delusion, with the hindrances, with attachment, with resistance. Um, all of them which come with a sense of ouch. The whole other way in the language of the Buddha is this yoni, yoni so manisikara. This uh, yoni, as I said, means womb. Some people will translate it as being the source. That there's a deep source within for a sensitivity that knows, that really knows. What does it know? It doesn't know quantum physics. It knows this is wholesome and this is not wholesome. This has integrity, this doesn't have integrity. This is healthy, this is not healthy. Spiritually healthy, psychologically healthy. You kind of feel and sense. It's like this guide that exists in there. Phenomenal. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to be smart. Doesn't have to have read a lot of books. It's just staying attuned here. Staying on the walkway, staying attuned, and feeling from this deep source underneath the reactivity. And that's why this relaxing is so important. Reactivity always involves tension. That which comes from this deep source, this wellsprings of knowing and motivation and attitudes, it doesn't have tension in it. What does it feel like to trust a source of knowing that has no tension? It can be frightening because the way people make themselves safe seemingly, tryingly, is to is through tension, through armor, through ideas, through social games, through pretending, through insisting, and through hiding, and through all these kinds of ways which we think we're safe. You probably saw Calvin and Hobbes cartoons here in New Zealand. Yeah. So I love the Calvin and Hobbes Hobbes cartoon where he's um, building a snow fort so he can attack people, I guess, snowballs or something, but to be safe in his fort. So he's building up the walls around him, but he's really close in. So it's like a little thing. He builds high walls. And by the time he's finished with it, he's trapped inside. (laughs) (laughs) 
And then he yells, help. (laughs) The very place that's supposed to be his safety made him not safe. So we do all this stuff to try to be safe. And it's frightening to put it down. It can be so, we're so familiar with it. It's so normal. It's ordinary. It's the, how we're, things are supposed to be done. But to have this sense, to trust the sensitivity that has no tension in it can be frightening. And it, as I said, in this practice, we're slowly and steady, steadily learning to be comfortable with discomfort. Learning to expand our capacity to be uncomfortable. And there might be a transitional time where you have to be uncomfortable with staying close to that place where there's no tension. Comfortable to stay close to that place where you don't have all your usual self-definitions and games and orientations and beliefs and securities that you held on to. It's a slow process. It's not all or nothing. But we can move, we start moving into this place, this deeper wellspring, this deeper source, this deeper fountain, a flow, suffusion of goodness, of warmth, arising out from deep in, deep inside. You don't have to let go of that. You don't have to lose that as you let go of your clinging. In fact, the opposite happens. The more you release all your clinging, including clinging to the deep source, the more the source is there to support you. So the fifth hindrance is doubt. And the fifth assist is doubt. Keep it simple. Don't walk in the difficult terrain next to the walkway. Take that quick, it's right there for you. In the next note, in the next clear moment, oh, this is what's happening. Or, I'm confused about what's happening. That's a perfectly good note for up on the walkway. You're there then. Don't be tricked into thinking you're supposed to understand. It's enough just to know how it is for you now. It's enough just to know the obvious as it is. Step after step after step. And then over time, I hope you'll come to appreciate this deep source of well-being and source of wisdom and understanding that can provide you with the information between what is wholesome and unwholesome so you become your own teacher. The book of Buddhism is now found in you. And if you believe you can't do this, it's just doubt. If you believe you can't do this, then please borrow my confidence in you. I'm confident you can. Thank you.